I lead a tiny but mighty division that drives transformative changes to create a much more equitable, safer, and more resilient city. I'm Denise Andrea Campbell. I'm the Executive Director of Social Development, Finance and Administration Division at the City of Toronto. I'm Anania Ayodele Grant and I'm the Director of Community Resources, which includes the Confronting Anti-Black Racism. My name is Anthony Morgan. I am the manager of the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit. We have a five-year plan from 2018 to 2022. Year two was focused very much on wanting to make sure that we are continuing to advance the interests and uh, the activities aimed at bettering outcomes for Black communities. The city's divisions are tasked with undertaking specific actions and are responsible for the communities they serve. For year two, our five priorities were Priority one, building an inclusive and equitable economy. Cities like Toronto and cities across North America have had a long history of using black bodies as placeholders for land that will become available or, or become valuable at some point. The Growing in Place initiative was established through strong relationships with community partners across the city that were really thinking about how the sort of fast moving gentrification across the city was pushing us out of a lot of the neighborhoods that we've lived in for a long time and called our own. A lot of the power that you see in black communities across the world come from living in proximity together. So when you start to break us up, when you start to gentrify us, you pull our power from under us. And so going in places around holding that power, holding that culture and making sure the city honors the value of historically black neighborhoods across the city. Priority two. Community Capacity Building. I started working with the CABR unit just over two years ago. It was uh, started through um, mainly the, the Mayor's Roundtable on Black Business. The CABR's action plan um, with the 22 actions I'd identified a number of key initiatives and as part of that, the Mayor recognized that the, um, the business support wasn't as fulsome as it should be. Um, so that's where he made a decision to establish a roundtable on black business and focusing on different areas. So the first one was Little Jamaica. I became the representative from um, economic development and culture, which is where my position um, is located. Uh, so for us, our you know main work is around the preservation of the Little Jamaica legacy um, and you know creating a space for African Caribbean entrepreneurship. We co-hosted a two-day consultation series uh, with the Black businesses on Little Jamaica. Our focus was understanding, um, you know, their main issues and concerns at the ground level and mapping out, you know, their future uh, for their business in the area. It is important that we, that, that we identify those barriers that are ingrained in the system, but not only identify, but move the yardstick so that we can see that our deliverables are making impact and that the people on the other end, the, the, who are receiving what the mayor and his team are, are, are destined to do, are also coming back and saying, we, we are feeling it, we are understanding it, we are gaining, and we appreciate the fact this committee has been put together. There was a host of different organizations that had been focused on ensuring that Black communities continue to have a space and a presence within the city that is valued and supported, and not just a transitionary space, but being here that we, so that we can live, thrive, and grow, not just today, but for future generations. Priority three, continuing to create culture change at the City of Toronto. So the Black Staff Network is meant to engage Black staff, um, provide opportunities for professional development, mentorship, um, and also as an advocacy body on behalf of Black staff. 
I think people were very thankful to have a place where they felt was a safe space to share their experiences past and present. Um, and also we got much more active in terms of the advocacy role and you know, trying to get a piece of the pie for black staff um, specifically. The CABR uh, action plan is very externally focused, but we have a lot of black staff working in the city of Toronto as well. And I think they're also looking you know, for, um, for us to represent them and you know, what their desires are in terms of a better employee experience at the city of Toronto. One of the key priorities in the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Plan pertains to employment and job opportunities for Black Torontonians. To address that, we also have done some city-led workshops geared towards targeting Black youth workshops such as how to apply for city jobs. These initiatives were really targeting young Black Torontonians to debunk some of the misconceptions around working at the city and also to ensure that our processes and our hiring practices and recruitment practices alike were accessible to black talent. So many people applied to the position, the lawyers, like me and the other intern, Robin Yamiche, we talked about it after we got the internship and we both thought that we wouldn't get the position because there were so many super qualified people. So I just tried my best and, and I, I believe that everything happens for a reason. And within the People and Equity uh, Division, 94% of us have actually undergone customized anti-Black racism training. I think one of the key things that we also did last year during the uprisings was to be able to provide a space for senior leaders in the city, non-Black allies, to come and have a conversation and ask maybe some difficult questions and share some difficult opinions, right? And help them to navigate, like understanding a little bit more what people were feeling and why they were feeling the way they were feeling. My name is Mohamed Shreya. I'm the manager of the city's police and reform unit. My name is Dr. Notisha Masakoy. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Health and Society and formerly the co-chair of the anti-racism advisory panel of the Toronto Police Services Board. Well, we saw uh, over the last year, year two of the action plan, the racial justice protests that happened across the world and in Toronto. And in these protests, people were calling for major reforms to policing, a rethink of what community safety looks like, and a change in how uh, Black communities are supported on the ground to ensure that uh, the social determinants of health that lead to over-policing do not continue. As the co-chair of the advisory panel on anti-racism for the Toronto Police Services Board, my role was very specific. It was to advise the board on the best way to implement the Andrew Loku inquest recommendations. The Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit was able to connect us to uh, key community organizations to develop this uh, work and to engage with. We did 33 community consultations with 17 community partners who have been doing work around mental health supports, around uh, questions around justice and policing and rethinking community safety. The inquest that followed from that had very specific recommendations to look at bias, to look at police bias in terms of how they were arriving to address mental health crisis and how they were engaging with Black members of our community. The CABR unit in suggesting how we can move forward on the conversation was very intentional about ensuring that we have diverse voices from the Black community at the table. So uh, ensuring that uh, LGBTQ2S in specific trans communities that have been over-policed and have had negative outcomes are at the table. Ensuring that newcomers are at the table. Ensuring that Black youth are at the table. So the advisory panel was made up of experts who had lived experience of being Black and living in Toronto. We had subject matter experts who were academics, whose expertise was working on issues of policing, anti-Black racism, and mental health. We also had experts in policing education 
and uh, members of the police service who also identified as black. Putting all those minds together created a scenario where we were able to come up with, with the best possible policy so that there was no excuse for this to not happen. I think if there wasn't a confronting anti-black racism unit, it would be more difficult uh, to build that community trust, to have the conversations, to build the uh, new alternative community safety models that we need and to help strengthen public safety. Priority four, investing in black children and youth. Before I started working with CABR, actually, I was at Starbucks. So um, I was selling coffee every day, but I was applying to jobs every weekend. And, you know, I got, thank, thankfully, I got the job with CABR. After I started working with CABR as an intern, um, I applied for another position as a support assistant. And then after that, I got another position as a hub coordinator. And now currently I'm working as a vaccine operations support specialist at the city of Toronto. So. Um, applying really has given me exposure because I've been in so many different situations. Priority five, improving customer service. The TTC is committed to an anti-racism strategy and we've also adopted the Toronto Action Plan to confront anti-black racism. And the goal is to really create meaningful systemic change. It includes uh, the collection, analysis, and reporting of desegregated race-based data. Desegregated data is extremely important. It is the only form of evidence that we have as Black people to explain why we are having the experiences that we're having in this city in particular. I can't change that if I don't have the data to support what we experience as Black people so that we understand quite clearly the magnitude. And so once you understand the magnitude of our experience, our negative experiences, then people can respond effectively. We have worked with CABR in a number of areas, including training, including review of our policies and initial review with an anti-Black racism analysis, a racial equity impact assessment, and to really promote the recruitment of diverse Black talent at the TTC. In year two, there were several challenges. I think the largest one was dealing with a global pandemic, knowing that we had an action plan, but needing to be nimble, to pivot, to be responsive, be flexible, and be able to meet the pressing needs for Black communities. Our community was hit tremendously hard, and, um, and it wasn't until months into the pandemic as advocates were trying to get governments and, 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 and public health systems to understand that there needed to be a targeted um, approach to black community and that we were most impacted. COVID-19 really just showed that black communities in particular were really vulnerable. Black organizations were impacted uh, really heavily by, by the pandemic. They had to make adjustments, but, but they had almost, you know, they had to to throw out of the window their plan and quickly adapt to the immediate needs of responding to, to the pandemic. I would definitely say that CABR was number one, the first call that I made. <laughs> when COVID hit and there was a lot of uncertainty was really, that was the first call to Anthony Morgan to say, what should we do or how should we be? moving forward. As soon as it came to be recognized that the pandemic wasn't going to be a two week or three week or four week shutdown, but would be an extended period, I started to get a flood of calls from different community organizations across the city. One of the ways in which we uh, focused on helping our communities is to come together to uh, find ways to create a collective voice. We tried to create a, a system of supporting our organization so that they could come together and create collective apps where they definitely identified their unique and particular challenges, but did so in a way that was, uh, that was coherent, that was consistent, and was coming from one force. And so it made it very difficult for our city leadership and also leadership at, at other levels of government to, uh, to not respond positively to what our communities were saying. Our organization was impacted by the pandemic in two ways. The 
One way was in terms of having to close and not being able to provide the face-to-face -face contacts with the community. The other way is that we were impacted in a more positive way in the sense that we were able to acquire resources to provide uh, a vulnerable community, the black communities and the families with resources that they needed to help them through this pandemic. I see the pandemic and our response to the pandemic and having a targeted equity plan for the pandemic as challenging the culture of the city or as changing the culture of the city. Because what that immediately did was put spotlight on the people who needed this the most, put spotlight on ensuring that black community voice was heard, that we were made visible. And so no matter where you were in the city, no matter what division you belong to in the city, everybody was responding to COVID because we made, we made black community priority. That means everybody had to prioritize the black community, right? So I'm not happy that there, <laughs> there was a pandemic, but what I do know is that change came for our community in the way that we were seeing.